Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for being here uh, and coming back in after your cupcakes and cookies. Really appreciate everybody attending this last session, which is going to be quite interesting, and I think you're going to find it very compelling. And the reason I believe that is because um, everyone is here because animal law is really the, at the cutting edge of law. And in fact, what we're going to talk about today, which does not seem to really be on the board yet, but hopefully will be soon, aquatic animal law is actually at the cutting edge of animal law. So we have two great speakers today, and I'm going to introduce them in a minute. But before I do, I just want to um, ask you to think about three points as they're speaking. Um, the first point is that, um, as I just said, aquatic animal law really is at the cutting edge of animal law. The second point is that to remember that 71% of the Earth is covered with water, most of that being the ocean. That's a massive ecosystem. And um, the third point is that all of the issues that you've heard here today and all the issues you deal with when you think about terrestrial creatures probably also apply to aquatic creatures. So let me just quickly introduce our panelists and also tell you um, my name is Paul Locke and I am an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore. And um, our speakers are experts in this area and they're going to help us think about how aquatic animal law could and should develop. They have two really very distinguished resumes and I'm not going to go through all of their achievements. You'll be able to find those on the um, app, the Moby app. But I do want to just call out a couple of things so you have um, a better idea of where they're coming from. Um, our first, uh, are you going to speak first? Uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Lynn Snedden. And Lynn is from um, the University of Liverpool. And for those of you who don't know, that, that's across the ocean over there. <laughs> Um, she, among other things, um, in, in addition to her academic appointments, she is Director of Bio-Veterinary Sciences at the university, and she does a lot of research to address questions about aquatic animals um, in the air aquatic environment, and looks at models on how to improve the treatment, especially of fish. She's also uh, got an extensive background in ethics and the understanding of ethical uses of animals, especially in research. And is the past, uh, in the past was the ethics chair of the Association for the Study of Animal Behavior. Our second speaker is Professor Kathy Hessler. And um, Professor Hessler is a clinical professor and a director of um, the law clinic, the animal law clinic at Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland. She uh, is the first and only faculty member hired to teach animal law full-time at any U.S. law school. She holds a doctoral degree, um, a JD, from William and & Mary, and also an LLM from Georgetown. So without further ado, I'm, I'm going to um, ask uh, Lynn to come up and give her talk. And um, after both Kathy and Lynn finish their talks, I'll come back up and, and we'll hope that you have some uh, questions and comments for them. Thank you. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me here to talk about something I'm very passionate about, which is improving the welfare of aquatic animals. And I was asked to tell you and inform you all about the wonders of aquatic animals, which is a real joy for me, so um, I hope you will indulge me. Uh, I could talk for many days, but I have a very short time here, and I will hopefully uh, show you that Animal, aquatic animals, especially fish, are sentient beings and deserve the same protection as we afford to mammals. So the first question one can ask about aquatic animals is, are they sentient? Are they feeling beings that deserve the kind of protection that we afford many of the um, terrestrial mammals and other terrestrial animals such as birds? Well, uh, many of my colleagues and I, we always use this quote, behaviorally speaking, fish can actually do anything that a mammal can do. And that's what I hope to share with you today. 
There are, of course, many uh, aquatic animals, uh, marine mammals, of course, and there would be no controversy over saying that dolphins and whales and seals, etc., are clever, intelligent beings that deserve protection. But what about the other types of animals, like fish or cephalopods, which are octopus, squid, nautilus, etc., crustaceans, crabs and lobsters, we also have aquatic reptiles and amphibians. What about these species? And they're often overlooked. So I want to start off by really uh, talking very briefly about what is the trouble, specifically with fish. And it, fish have presented a real controversy. And it's hotly debated whether they are actually sentient and whether they're capable of experiencing positive and negative emotions. I'm going to define sentience for you because there has been many, many definitions. Of course, scientists can never agree with each other, but I'm going to present the latest definition. And then I'm going to show you that fish actually possess many of the abilities that, to be considered capable of sentience. Uh, I'm going to show that they have a real ability to experience pleasure and also negative emotions such as pain. And finally, I'll very, very briefly talk about the um, United Kingdom's legislation on protecting aquatic animals. So what is the trouble with fish? Why is it so hotly debated? Um, well, we have a very complicated relationship with fish. Some people like to eat them and use them as a foodstuff, and they are farmed intensively in aquaculture. They're caught in huge, massive numbers. Trillions of fish each year are caught in large-scale fisheries. People also use fish as a hobby, a recreation. We call it angling in the UK. In the UK, there's something like five million people enjoy angling. Um, and I took a brief walk uh, along the Esplanade and saw lots of people fishing down there. And people use it as a sport. You know, they want to catch the biggest fish. So people use it as something that is a pastime. We also use fish in very large numbers in experimental research, and fish have actually become the second most popular experimental model behind mice. We actually use more fish in experiments now across the globe than we use lab rats. People also, of course, if you've ever been to Monterey, which I was very pleased to visit in California many years ago, pay a lot of money to go in and look at fish in public aquaria and in zoos. So they're held in captivity for uh, education purposes, conservation. But people are, use them as something that they like to go and enjoy watching. And also people keep them as ornamental pets, companion animals. And actually fish are now the third most popular companion animal behind cats and dogs. And probably actually the most populous in terms of numbers. Something like one in 10 households has a fish in a tank or in a pond. So that explains our very complicated relationship with them. You might view them as a foodstuff, you might view them as a hobby for your own enjoyment, you might view them as an experimental model, or you might view them as something beautiful that you like to keep. Uh, and so there's a lot of conflict there because the angling, uh, the recreational fishing, the fisheries, and the aquaculture industries um, are very much opposed to the idea of improving fish welfare. Not all, of course, but some are opposed. And these are powerful political bodies that can really uh, campaign against the idea that fish are uh, sentient beings and should be afforded the same protection as mammals. Also, the vast numbers of fish that we use, something like 4,000 species are kept in public aquaria, trillions are caught in fisheries, as I said before. So we, we really should be looking at this as, as something that, you know, the, the sheer number of individuals that are affected by the things that we do to them is quite significant. So I think personally that it's very important that we are protecting aquatic animals, especially fish. Of course, um, Disney has done a lot for fish, actually making them cute and cuddly, um, finding Nemo, I'm allowed to say that, finding Dory more recently, um, has shown fish in a much more positive light, that they have personalities, etc. But they are uh, affected by speciesism. Of course, the traditional sense of that word is that there's humans are superior and then that led to the use of animals. However, I think more recently, speciesism really means that uh, animals which are non-mammals, anything other than mammals, is not considered as important and so is then viewed less important by the public and also in terms of any legislation and protection. So let's move on to defining sentience. What is it? Well, uh, Don Broom, in his recent book, uh, Sentience and Animal Welfare, which you can see here, 
um, has defined sentience for us and really brought the definition up to date. It's a, a being that has some ability, and so I've highlighted some. Obviously, it's very difficult not to be anthropomorphic, but animals have very different life histories, very different evolutionary pressures. We must remember they are not identical to us. And so the idea that they should have some of these abilities is really important. They will be very different to us, and we should be anthropomorphic. However, they should have some ability. And then in blue, I've actually uh, sort of put my own spin on Don Broom's definitions. But they should be able to evaluate the actions of others in relations to themselves and to third parties. So, and, and sort of my speak, that's they should be able to form relationships with each other and with other species. They should be able to have memory. They should remember some of their own actions. We call this in science, have cognitive ability, higher cognitive functions. They should be able to learn tasks and remember them. They should be able to assess the risks and benefits of any situation or, or of their behavior. And I would call this, they should be able to make behavioral decisions about what they, what they want to do. They should have some feelings. Um, and I, I prefer to think of this as they should have a positive affective state. Things like pleasure is positive, but also negative affective states. So they should experience stress, pain, and fear. And finally, they should have some degree of awareness, and this is often called consciousness. They should have some sense of I and how I relate to the world. So what I'm going to do now is, is go through each of these criteria and show you that fish do actually have these abilities. So the first thing we need to ask is, do they form relationships? There's a wonderful example uh, of rabbit fishes. These are coral reef fish. Um, and they are able to communicate with each other, signal to each other, and also um, act in a mutually beneficial way towards each other. And this uh, behavior is called direct reciprocity. And these, they form pairs where they uh, help each other out, basically. Um, what you can see here are some rabbit fish species. This fish here is pointed upwards, away from the coral reef, away from where the food is, and is actually being vigilant. It's looking for predators. That allows its partner to forage to find food. And you can see a range of species of rabbit fish do this. And this is very rare. They equally match each other's behavior. And they benefit each other because one is watching out for predators while the other one eats. And that carefully uh, precise behavior is, is higher cognitive function and is only seen in a couple of mammals and a few bird species. So I'll just show you this behavior in action. So what you see here are the, the pair. You can see one is facing up out of the reef while one is foraging. This is a precisely matched behavior. So one is going to become vigilant while the other one goes on to feed. So swapping roles. They precisely match each other in their behavior. That means they have to have the ability to understand what the other is doing and match their behavior accordingly. And as I said, very few animal species show this direct reciprocity behavior. And you can see again, they're changing, changing roles again. And that has great benefits for them. Um, and I'll just show you one of the benefits in this next video. What you can see here is the fish are, there's a signal, they both scatter and a large predator swims past. So it's a very much a beneficial relationship, but they are able to form this partnership within species. Also, there's a benefit in terms of how much they get to eat and how long they eat for. So they actually do better when they form these partnerships. Now, fish also form uh, specific partnerships between species, so even outside of their own species, with very different looking fish. And a very uh, famous example is the grouper and the moray eel. Um, they cooperate together and go hunting together. And again, there is communication between them, signaling, and they act mutually beneficially for each other. And I'll just show you some of the videos for this. So what you can see, this is a big grouper fish. This is the moray in its crevice. It's coming up, it's head shaking, and it's basically asking, do you want to come and hunt? Then you see them swimming off together. You just see the moray eel, this eel behind the grouper. Off they go to enjoy themselves hunting, finding food together. gather. 
And then here what we see, the grouper is pointing with its head and it's shaking and it's signaling to the moray, I can't get in this crevice, but you can. The moray comes along and gets in there. And basically they're flushing out prey. And these guys are more successful if they hunt together. They get more food if they hunt together. Um, uh, it's an amazing ability to have, but to actually form a relationship with other species. I did think it would be very difficult to follow the last session with those, the wonderful tales of, of guys with their, their dogs, but I think that shows you that even fish can do these sorts of things. So I'm going to tick that criteria. Um, yes, they do form relationships within and between species. Are they able to learn and, and remember what they've learned? Well, there's a great myth, the three-second goldfish memory. If you Google this, you get a huge range of cartoons, mugs, T-shirts, key rings, all sorts of things. I'll just email this to myself as a reminder. Ooh, look, I got a new email. Well, this is, a, this is, this is actually a, a myth. And a, a colleague of mine who works on learning and memory in goldfish said one of his goldfish remembered a task three years afterwards because this is an animal that lives to 45 years. Um, if you look after your goldfish, it can persist up to 45 years. So he found three years was the longest memory recall in these fish. What can we do? And uh, behavioral scientists do test learning and memory. Fish, they're a really interesting model. What they would do is, oh, excuse me. Um, uh, they um, would train the fish in a maze. And basically, you put the fish in, you train it to turn left to find food. You can see the happy face. Um, what you do then is you turn your maze round and you put your fish in the opposite start place. If the fish is just remembering turns, so it's not really thinking deeply about this, it will go to the wrong area. But what we find is that actually the goldfish remembers the cues, it remembers the landmarks, and it can successfully make its way even if you turn your maze round. So again, they are able to learn and remember. And this is a very good example of what you can do with goldfish coming up. So your fish does nothing. Until now. So, yeah, um, you can actually train uh, many fish species to do very complicated things, play basketball, etc. Um, and that's thought to be a, a form of behavioral enrichment for captive fish, you know, if you train them to do tasks. Um, I, I'm not sure I can... I'm not... Um, advocating that, but it's up to you if you want to buy it, of course. <laughs> so, um, are fish able to count? Well, the answer is actually yes. So here's an experiment. In this guppy fish, these are these um, beautiful little fish from Trinidad and Tobago, they were trained to get a food reward if they actually touched a lever which had the most number of spots on it. So they were trained at uh, two versus three spots. If they touched the three-spot lever, they got... A, 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 a reward and then they were tested on different numbers and actually they were still able to count they always touched a lever that had more spots on it so that shows that fish actually have numeracy skills which is a high level cognitive process so I think I've shown you that yes fish are more clever than the myth of the three second memory and we can tick that criteria here what you'll see is, do fish assess, assess risks and benefits? And what's interesting about this video is that we're putting in an, an underwater camera in my lab. Um, what you can see here is the camera is, is very strange to this rainbow trout. It's never seen one before. And we call that a novel object test. And what you do is you record the length of time that the fish comes and approaches that strange object. This particular fish, which you can see here, sits in the corner. It's, it does not approach within 15 minutes. Um, and effectively, it's what we call a shy fish. It's risk averse. These are very cautious animals that will not approach. They don't take risks. They stay undercover. And it's actually averse to this novel object test. And, and so that, that tank's about a meter wide, and it just sits in the corner and never approaches in 15 minutes. Whereas the next fish, this is what we call a bold fish, and this fish is not in the slightest bit bothered by this novel object. It comes up to inspect it. You can see it's very close. 
because it's gone out of shot. So again, very close. So these fish are uh, what we call bold. They are a risk taker. Um, they're very active, they're very dominant, um, and they uh, take risks uh, throughout their life. And so you can see that's the same species as another rainbow trout, but their behavior is completely different. And you can see this fish comes right up into the camera. And it actually, uh, if I sh kept showing you it, which uh, um, I'd love to watch another 15 minutes, but um, I'm sure you wouldn't. Um, basically, it bites the camera. And you could, if the sound was on, you can actually hear me giggling outside. Um, but these, these fish, these rainbow trout, are a wonderful model for animal personality studies. And these are animals that show particular behavioral traits that are linked to this bold and shy behavior. And that colors everything they do. So they do assess risks and benefits. Uh, another species that assess benefits are cleaner rats. These are these, um, oops, excuse me. These are these um, lovely little fish here. These are called cleaner rats. And what they do is exactly what they're called. They clean other fish of parasites. And um, basically, you can see this is a predatory fish, the moray eel, which would normally eat this fish. But Many of these fish come up to points on the reef where there is a cleaning station that the cleaner fish forms, and they open their mouths and their gills and they let these fish clean all the parasites off them. They can also, of course, as you can see, do it for humans if you go diving long enough to the cleaning station. Um, what, the, what is interesting is that these fish actually prefer the skin of their clients, um, but of course you don't want to be killing, a, a, sorry, don't want to be biting a, a predatory fish. Um, and what they do is uh, they must maintain their reputation to get repeat business. So they will take the odd little bite, but they, they gauge whether they, the fish is willing to put up with this or not. But they do want repeat business, and their reputation is very important to them. And we can see that here. Uh, in this experiment, basically, um, you have an invisible bystander. So the client and the cleaner can't see this ob observing fish. So the cleaner does occasionally bite its client. However, if the cleaner can see a visible observer, a bystander, it, has mu it does not bite the client at all because it wants to get the new client. It wants to maintain its reputation. So they are less likely to bite if they have an audience. So it does assess benefits and it does manipulate its client. So I think we can tick that criteria as well. Our next criteria is, is, is the positive or negative affective state. Now, do fish seek out positive experiences? If I turn to the cleaner-client uh, relationship, the cleaner also massages its client. So will the, the, cl the client seek out massage? And to design an experiment like this, what you have to do is have a model cleaner with some brushes and have it moving and you have your client fish, will it actually voluntarily uh, interact with this model? And the answer is yes. Here we have a surgeon fish, um, and here we have the moving model, and you can see the surgeon fish orientates itself and gets a nice massage. Now, now um, when we have a massage at the beauty spa, um, we feel very calm uh, and less stress when we leave. And it's the same with the fish. The, the stress levels in these fish are much lower if they've been massaged. So that shows that they do seek out positive effects. Now, the next uh, thing that we have to show, and sadly, um, in order to study poor welfare, one does have to cause it. Um, and as I said before, it's um, really important that when we are using animals, and I realize some of you don't agree with that, that their health and welfare is something that's of great importance. And I, I particularly have devoted my career to improving the welfare of fish. And pain is a key factor. Really, um, because these uh, uh, people that use fish in the, in, in the industries like fisheries and aquaculture are powerful lobbying bodies politically, one has to go to the government with sound scientific evidence to get any changes affected. So one has to show that fish are capable of experiencing pain. And that's something that has been shown. And it's something that's incredibly important when thinking about animal welfare because it's that that suffering that's the only thing that drives the protection of animals. If we can show that they suffer, then by doing that, 
we can actually drive changes in the treatment of these animals. If you don't do that, then you will be laughed out of the room, basically. Now, I'm about to show some videos. I'm sorry if they're upsetting to you in any way, so you might not want to watch them. The first video is a rainbow trout uh, feeding on a smooth gammarus. It's a little, uh, in, a little uh, woodlouse type thing. Uh, and then the second two videos, are, it's a spiny gammarus. So there's the uh, uh, potential for the fish to be um, hurt by the spines. So if you don't want to watch it, please look away. So this is a rainbow trout, and it's feeding on a smoothed gammarus. And you can see it catches it incredibly quickly. In the next video, it's a spiny gammarus. You see it's having up quite a lot of trouble. But the rainbow trout still does actually manage to eat it in this case. Now, and this one is another spined gammarus. And in that example, the fish doesn't go for the gammarus again. That experience was um, enough to put it off. Now, it's very difficult to get into the mind of an animal. Um, we could do it in a number of ways. We can, we can look at these behavioral changes, and are they ameliorated by the use of pain relief? Um, and my lab's really dedicated itself to looking at how we can improve the health and welfare of laboratory fish. As I said before, they're the second uh, most popular model. We're developing an automated software tool that can uh, view the fish, use its behavior, and decide whether it's, um, it's healthy or not. Um, we use half a million of fish in experiments in the UK alone. It's something like 1.4 million across Europe. Um, and so I think their health and welfare is a real priority. We should be assur assuring that if we are using fish, we need to make sure their health and welfare is, is, is maintained. Um, and we, we, we've based this on zebrafish, um, which is a, probably accounts for 50% of the numbers used in experiments because it's a model organism. And th they are subject to procedures, and unfortunately, that do are invasive, that cause tissue damage, that would give rise to pain in humans and other uh, mammals. And it may be that if we can use painkillers, uh, analgesics, that we can actually alleviate that pain. And that's effectively what we've tried to show. Um, but up until 2002, um, it was thought that fish did not experience pain at all. And it was only really when my lab first identified the nerves that fish have that are identical to those in humans and mammals that we actually improve this. So what you'll see here is just a normal control zebrafish. It swims constantly. Um, as you can see, it uses the middle of the tank and it uses uh, uh, the whole area. Um, so that's a normal control undisturbed fish. Um, we're tracking its behavior in real time so we can get real time health assessment. The next fish, and you may not want to watch this, has gone through a procedure called fin clipping, where part of the tail fin is removed under anesthesia, so the fish is asleep. However, painkillers are not routinely given. So you can see the video has actually started, and the fish is not really moving very much. Um, and effectively, it's, it's moving its tail a lot, but not going anywhere. So its behavior is adversely affected by this. And then in the next video, what we have is a fish that does, has had this tail fin clip, but has been given a painkiller, and you can see that its behavior is more normal. So we've been using all this data um, to try and, and develop an automated tool that will allow carers to intervene. Um, this is just to give you an idea. Here is the use of a control normal fish, and then this is after fin clip, so you can see the behavior is quite different. This is space use in the tank. We can try a range of uh, pain-killing drugs. You can see lidocaine is very effective, um, flunixin at a high dose, and morphine at a high dose. So then we can add that to the tank water and improve the fish's welfare. And we've developed this health index, which um, basically monitors the real-time behavior of the animals. And here it's just working. It's based on color. So what we have is a healthy fish. We've paused the video, and then it's um, basically being fin-clipped. And then you can see it's coming up as unhealthy. 
and basically that refreshes every minute and it can send an alert to the researcher or the carer so that they can come and intervene. And so you see it refresh there. And if you want to read more about this, um, I have provided some materials to the conference about defining and assessing animal pain. Um, that also covers all animals, terrestrial and aquatic. Um, but if you're particularly interested in aquatic animals, um, there's a review here which covers some really interesting work in octopus, squid, crabs, and lobsters. Um, there are some skeptics to uh, uh, fish feeling pain. Um, and basically, uh, it centers on having a human brain. It says animals can only experience pain if they have a human-like cortex, a human-like brain. And that means only primates can experience pain. Well, I'm, I personally don't agree with that. So um, the last thing, which I'll very, very quickly just say is self-recognition. Fish are able to recognize themselves here. The stitch lid recognizes its own odor its own smell compared to other fish. And also, what, what a recent study has shown is that manta rays actually recognize themselves in mirrors. Um, and so here what you can see is them blowing bubbles at themselves um, when they pass the mirror, which they don't normally do, so they recognize themselves. So our fish sentient, my response is yes, they are, and they deserve protection. In Britain, we have legislation and regulations governing the use of fish experimentation, which are very rigorous. Fish are treated the same as mammals. Farm Animal Welfare Council said last year, fish experience pain, and we need to treat them as such. The Animal Welfare Act covers pet fish, but not wild fish. And there was prosecution. Um, I don't know if you know that neck nominate craze that went through the internet person uh, it drank a live goldfish and was, this is the, the consequence, and the second person was also prosecuted. So I'd just like to finish by thanking uh, Kathy and Paul for their interesting discussions. Liberty putting up with me having 14 videos and all of them having to be converted by the audiovisual staff here. Um, uh, and thank you to my funding bodies, NC3Rs and the European Union. And thank you so much to you for listening. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're nearly at the end, so I want to add my thanks to my co-panelist, Dr. Sneddon, and our moderator, Dr. Locke. I'm the non-doctor on the panel. Um, and I want to thank you guys for being here this late in the afternoon. So I'm here to talk about the legal side, um, sort of the legal implications of what we do next with the information that we learn from Dr. Sneddon and others. Um, and I'm calling this using the law to see and protect aquatic animals because I think one of the first problems we have to address is that we don't see them. And what we don't see, we find hard to protect. Um, I think some of the other panels earlier today also indicate the power of the one and the power of naming. And so animals in the singular are much more easy for us to comprehend and to be concerned about than in mass quantities. So when we think about fish, right, or when we think about crustaceans, that's a real hard concept to get our, our minds around and to understand what kind of protections might be needed. But when, when we have one animal and that animal has a name, Dory, right, we begin to understand a little bit more about that animal as an individual and as worthy of pr our protection. Um, there's an awful lot to talk about and I'm gonna try and go kind of quickly and I just wanna let you know at the beginning that there's, it's not possible to say all the things that we wanna say, that was true for Dr. Sneddon too. She could talk about the capacities of other animals in addition to fish. I'm taking on something in the animal law clinic called the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative and we're gonna be talking about animal law work across the spectrum. Um, and I can't talk to you about all of the spectrums in which aquatic animals find themselves in legal difficulty just yet. Um, so I'm gonna do something of an overview. I also wanna say that Dr. Sneddon's work has been critical already in helping to change the, the dialogue that we're having in society. So Jonathan Balcom has published articles in the New York Times quoting her work, um, and he came up with a phrase which I thought was very nice, that fish have a biography and not just a biology and he's using her work to explain to the public why they should care. Um, 
my view is that we have enough scientific information now to say that we should adopt the precautionary principle in legal decision making. I recognize not all of the scientists are ready to say that, but as a lawyer, I feel like we have enough evidence to say we should actually flip the script and we should start thinking about what it is that we think we can do to animals. And if we know now that we can cause them pain, we should stop and say before we allow ourselves to do something to them, we have to justify um, and we have to minimize that pain. The good news is that there are um, folks working on this. We're developing alternatives, um, and I can talk about that a little bit in a moment. Usually I save good news for the end of the talk, but I'm gonna actually start with good news because this is a little heavy and it's been a long day. So I'm gonna start with some good news um, in the aquatic animal arena, in the legal arena. There is a proposed NOAA ban, the, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration ban on a swim with dolphins programs, um, which is really good news and new ones are being sort of developed as we speak, so hopefully that goes into place. Obama, President Obama designated the first national marine monument in the Atlantic, which was 5,000 square miles, about the size of Connecticut. It's off the coast of New England. The sonar case against the Navy went well. We can talk about that later, um, but yay. <laughs> um, there's SeaWorld is ending breeding and ending shows. Um, their, their entertainment shows. The cosmetics test ban was upheld um, at, under some pressure. There's a proposal underway for organic standards for farmed fish and shrimp and other species in the US. Dolphins at the National Aquarium in Baltimore will be moved to sanctuary. Um, there's a whale sanctuary project underway with Dr. Lori Marino. Um, also importantly, the, the NAS, the National Academy of Sciences, reports that 77% of the world's fisheries could be restored to health in 10 years if we change our fishing practices. That's an, an enormous number of change, um, a, a really large impact, right, in a really short period of time. There's no other place in our environmental work where we think we can have that kind of impact in that short a time. So it's something for us to be thinking about very seriously. Okay. So, um, so I'm not going to, I'll be really brief about these. We've already talked about the categories, so I don't want to talk too much about them. This is a sea lion from Oregon who's been uh, branded so the sea lion won't eat the salmon, which, because the people need to eat the salmon, right? And so we're trying to protect the salmon so people can eat them and we're branding sea lions as pr problem animals and if these sea lions who are already branded continue to eat the salmon, then they're killed. Um, we talked a little bit about categories of animals and. And again, this is the kind of work that we'll be doing, but we can't cover all of these categories in the short presentation time today. But just understand that pretty much where animals are in, when we're thinking about terrestrial animals, they're in those places um, for aquatic animals as well, and some places that we don't really consider. But let's talk with, uh, start with the farming, fish farming. So when we talk about fish, we talk about two different kinds of categories. So there's fish farming, sometimes that's called aquaculture, and that's basically like CAFOs in water, okay? And then there's capture, and we'll talk about them separately. These are just a couple of pictures of what that looks like. It, it can look an awful lot worse, but I didn't want to traumatize people. Um, numbers. So w some of the numbers are kept in the millions of tons because they don't, again, count individual beings, right? And so there's so many of them who are killed or captured. We don't even talk about their lives, we just talk about how much they sort of weigh overall. Um, but think about these numbers, right? 97 million tons, right? Just let that sink in for a minute. So it's more than the terrestrial animals, um, the meat and poultry. And then we have, so this is, and this is just farmed animals, right? These are not the, the ones we're pulling from the ocean. It doesn't count a number of other kinds of categories of animals. It doesn't count bycatch. It doesn't ca count animals that are lost in nets. It doesn't count a number of things. Um, so these are some fishing practices, what it might look like in the oceans. These are the capture practices. So the numbers over 167 million tons worldwide. In the US, almost 5 million for capture um, and half a million for aquaculture. We're talking about a tremendous, tremendous number of lives being impacted. Um, one of the other things that I would say is in doing our work, it's really difficult to get 
um, consistent numbers, right? So it depends on what agency you're talking to, it depends on what country you're looking at, it depends on how they're calculating these numbers. So I would just want to say take all of the numbers with a grain of salt because on every sort of website and government agency you're going to find slightly different numbers. So I'm trying to be conservative in the numbers that I chose and use credible institutions like the FAO. Um, we're talking about a lot of money as well. So one trillion fish caught annually is sort of a rough estimate. Um, 51 billion dollars annually in fish trade. Billion with a B, right? $51 billion. And the other thing that's really important to recognize about this is these numbers are only going up, and they're going up exponentially. And it's not just happenstance. There's the industry's pushing, governments are pushing, and I'll talk about that in a quick second. But so $51 billion in trade, 36 million people directly employed in fish capture or farming, 36 million people. And that's not the people selling, right? That's just involved in capture and, and farming. In Zimbabwe alone, 22,000 people are involved in fish farming, not traditional fishing, fish farming, aquaculture. In South Africa, 71,000. Those governments are, are pushing these as methods of reducing poverty and hunger in their countries. And so they see this as a solution to other problems and they're not thinking about the other problems that they're causing and trying to address really important, important problems. But as a result, the funding for these activities are increasing, government support for these activities are increasing, and regulation is not. Another thing to be thinking about, um, which is a, another whole conversation, um, human slaves are often used in the fishing industry. So it's something I didn't even realize myself, but you know, people eat shrimp, and you can buy peeled shrimp at the store, the grocery store, and human beings are peeling those shrimp by hands. Some of them are slaves. Some of them have been enslaved for decades. They have been taken from their countries and their homes and um, not returned. The number of um, just farmed thin fish, so I'm not talking about the other kinds of fish or other kinds of beings, um, is some estimates 10 billion, some estimates upwards of 100 billion animals annually. Um, far exceeds the number of terrestrial farmed fish. And the same numbers are estimated to be captured from the wild each year. The estimates also suggest that 62% of all food fish will come from aquaculture farms just by 2030. So we have a lot of work to do in thinking about regulating those entities. I want to say really quickly, um, because I'm not going to go through all those other categories, but fish as pets, we talked about um, Finding Dory. Every time Disney does something good, they do something bad as well. Sorry, Disney. Um, so it's great that they humanize animals to a certain extent and make them more accessible. They're the fact that they have emotions and capacities, but then people run out and buy them, right? Whatever the animal is, whether it's Dalmatians after that movie or Dory after that movie. Um, and most of those animals are poorly treated, they don't last well in homes, they're not well cared for. But fish as pets is a much larger industry than you might imagine. Um, and the amount of damage that occurs to our oceans when we try to catch those fish for entertainment and for pets is pretty significant. Cyanide is a method that's widely used to catch exotic fish for aquaria and pets. 500 metric tons are used in just the Philippines alone every year. 500 metric tons of cyanide. About 50% of the other fish in the area are also killed at that time, and the coral reefs are dying as a result. Um, six to 10 million fish caught this way, not other ways, just this way, enter the US every year to become pets. Six to 10 million. We also have fish kills, so I'm not gonna, I know that um, Jessica and Eli mentioned really briefly this morning fish kills, and it's something just to, um, to mention. So fish kills result from pesticides and fertilizers entering our waterways. Um, it reduces the amount of oxygen in the water that the fish have available to breathe. One fish killed just this year in March um, in Florida. Florida is called the fishing capital of the world. Just one affected over a 50 mile stretch of the Indian River and killed hundreds of thousands of fish. And that was just one fish kill in the United States this year. Um, 
it affected flounders, crab, stingray, mullet, and it also started killing the seagrass, which the manatees need. Um, and so you can imagine the problems for the entire population and ecosystem. Um, I didn't want to do too many gruesome pictures, but a couple. The picture on the left is drying shark fins. So that's just plates, sort of, you know, pallets of shark fins. And obviously every one of those fins represents an animal that was killed and, generally speaking, thrown back into the ocean. Um, blue sharks on the left-hand side. So we're talking about numbers that most of us are not really aware of. And there is even less regulation for these practices than there are for regulations of any other kinds of farming practices. Many of the fish species, um, many fish species are close to collapse or extinction in the oceans. Um, corals could be a whole talk, right? Coral reefs and the dangers that they're facing. But I'll just give you a couple quick examples for, from the fish. Blue t bluefin tuna populations have been reduced by 96% in the Pacific Ocean just since 1960 and 85% in the Atlantic Ocean. One um, example in the whale family, the southern resident killer whale population in the Pacific Northwest, which is where I'm from, have only 84 members left. And despite that, and despite being um, on the, on the, having a listing, the government is seeking, the U.S. government is seeking to reduce what little protections there are for those animals. Um, just so that you know, some of the, the problems that they're facing are from noise. And I think a lot of people, when they hear about noise bothers uh, marine mammals, they don't really understand what that means. But it actually can destroy internal organs. Um, it can destroy hearing and echolocation. Um, shipping is also a significant uh, problem, pollution, and loss of salmon, their main food source. So that's enough probably about fish farming and capture. Um, a couple other quick things to be thinking about. We're genetically modifying fish um, at a pretty rapid rate. So this is, um, the lower fish is a farmed salmon, and this is a genetically modified salmon that has been approved by the U.S. government um, to enter the market. Um, and we also don't have labeling, so we don't know if, whether you're eating a salmon that's a wild-caught salmon, um, a farm salmon, or a GM salmon. Now, there may be labels, right? And they may be accurate or they may be inaccurate, but we don't have a government regime for labeling. Um, we also have diseases. This is just a small um, example of what happens when we have fish farming. We have a significant amount of pollution. We introduce different kinds of food. We have fish swimming in their own excrement. And we have significant diseases that aren't necessarily captured or contained um, to where they live. They, they can enter the wild and affect wild animals, wild species as well. So it's a pretty grim picture, and I'm sorry to be sort of the bearer of such bad news at the end of a, of a day, but um, I'm gonna turn now quickly to research. So Dr. Sneddon has already said quite a lot. Um, I wanted to, to build on something that she said. So one of the reasons that zebrafish are used so widely in research is initially because their embryos are, are translucent, um, transparent, and now they're being bred transparent. And so researchers can actually see tumors um, without invasive procedures. So on the one hand, that's good. Um, but on the other hand, their utility as a research model has, as she suggested, um, caused them to be about half of the, the animals now used in research. Um, so these are just a couple of pictures of the um, facilities in which the fish may um, exist in research labs. I think, again, as Jessica or Eli mentioned earlier, so in the the fish farming context, some of them are in the oceans. There's not that much in the U.S. right now, though it's growing. There's some in rivers, and there's some on dry land. So these are obviously, um, these are research facilities and dry land. Um, so in just sort of s supporting some of what Dr. Snedden said about science, right? So these animals can feel. They're sentient. Um, they have a consciousness, and I'm taking, uh, people can, you know, quibble with what I'm saying. I'm taking the science that supports these statements. There is science that, that runs counter to it, I recognize. But they can feel, they have consciousness. Some are proven to be self-aware. That was sort of the, the Ray video that Dr. Snedden showed. They cooperate across species. They use tools. They protect their young and each other. And they're even aware of time. 
So they have incredible, incredible capacities that we're just beginning to learn about. Um, fish can also recognize human faces. Um, there have been a number of studies in which this has happened. They have some substantial perceptual ability, as Dr. Stedden said, pain and adrenal systems, emotional responses, long and short-term memory, complex cognition, individual differences, tool use, social learning, and deception. Um, one researcher called them Machiavellian-like for the, the particular species he was looking at because they could deceive one another to achieve their goals. The fundamental irony when we're talking about research is that we're using animals as a model to learn things by and large for human benefit. So we're saying that biologically speaking, these animals are sufficiently close to us genetically that the product of the research is applicable to human beings, right? So they're close enough to us genetically as cousins that it makes sense to research on them and learn something useful, but not close enough to us ethically, right? That we, we put more restrictions on our ability to do the things to them that we do. And so that fundamental irony is a really important thing for us to consider um, in the law. Another thing that's problematic about using fish is that I think one of the things that happens in research is that the scientists have said, well, let's, we understand there are problems with mammals, so let's kind of go further down the taxonomy, and it's easier, um, not just logistically to use these animals, but it's easier to use them sort of for how it feels, sort of on a day-to-day -day level. Um, but the more that we do that, it just delays our ability to find actual alternatives, right? Computational biology, the genomics, um, human, gene, human tissue cultures, personalized medicine. We have so many other technological opportunities um, that we're either not pursuing as quickly as we could, we're not funding them as much as we could because we're relying on these other models. And so the sooner we move away from these models, the better. Um, we have the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, which, in which a number of preeminent scientists have said that um, these animals are conscious. Um, we also have the, something called the three R's, which says in research we should have used refinement, reduction, and replacement to try to minimize the pain, use as few animals as possible, and when possible, replace animal models. Um, and some people I have started talking about the four R's, with the, which the fourth R being rehoming. So the idea that after we're done using animals in research, um, that we have an ethical obligation to give them a new home and a better home. Interestingly, um, there, there are more regulations with respect to how aquatic animals are dealt with in research than there are in, in farming, right, in aquaculture and farming. So as few regulations as there are from my perspective, I'd like a lot more, um, there are at least more than there are in the fishing and farming context. Um, I think we should adopt a number of the um, steps that have been taken in the UK. I think the Animals Act in the UK um, is a particularly useful framework, and I think we could benefit from that. Um, the World Organization for Animal Health, the OIE's animal, Aquatic Animal Health Code um, and Transport Guidelines are also models that we could be looking at in the US. All right, so not a lot of time. Let's talk really, really briefly about the law. So. Many states have anti-cruelty laws that exclude um, fish. This comes in a number of different um, sort of categories, if you will. So some don't speak to fish at all or aquatic animals at all, which means that the purview of the, of the statute doesn't protect them. And they're not saying, we know the fish are out there, we're just choosing not to protect them. They're saying, we don't even consider them, right? Then the middle model is, okay, so we know they're out there, but they're exempted if they're in certain categories, so say a farmed animal category. And there are actually, um, there is a third category which, in which aquatic animals are not necessarily precluded. So there are 10 states in the US, um, you may be happy to know, in which fish are not um, included or excluded that might be helpful. And there are 10 states And I'm not even over time yet. <laughs> I'm trying hard not to be. Um, 
So there's some work that we can do in the animal cruelty context, but it's not actually as bad as I thought it would be. I thought it would be um, sort of fully excluded at the very beginning. Um, fish are not even mentioned in slaughter laws. They are not mentioned in transportation laws. So that means we don't have regulations. We don't have statutory level um, protections for them in those huge contexts. Um, we've just talked, we've talked about research and I'll skip reading for the time being. Um, so there are some protections for aquatic animals in different contexts. So wildlife and endangered animals as with terrestrial animals get the most level of protections. If aquatic animals are pets, in some states they do get um, protections. Marine mammals get more protections, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, and there are some regulatory protections. So even though the Animal Welfare Act excludes these animals um, from protection, generally speaking, we have the Public Health Service Policy um, the Guide to Care and Use of Laboratory Animals, which in its eighth edition um, just a few years ago added a section on the care and management and housing of aquatic animals in research. Um, really quickly, the Animal Welfare Act. So it's useful to think about sort of where it began and, and what it was trying to do. So initially it covered dogs, cats, rabbits, guinea pigs, hamsters, and non-human primates in 1966. In 1970, it went to warm-blooded animals. Then the secretary excluded birds, mice, rats, horses, and farmed animals. Then the act was amended to do that statutorily. Um, and we do have some rules in there for marine mammals. So it was never contemplated, right, that the act would cover aquatic species. Yet it's a, it's a gaping hole in thinking about our whole regulatory regime in the United States because the Animal Welfare Act sort of sets the standard for a lot of what we do in other legal and regulatory contexts. Um, so we need to add, uh, let me come back for a second. Um, so we need, to, we need to address that. Um, we need to deal with the exclusions in the Animal Welfare Act. We need to increase warm-blooded animals. We need to deal uh, with protection for invertebrates as well as vertebrates and cold-blooded animals. Um, we estimate that there's about 20 million fish annually caught just for exhibition purposes. So we're talking about another area in which the Animal Welfare Act applies, 20 million. Um, and as Dr. Snedden said, upwards between 10 and 13% of American households keep fish. Um, the Animal Welfare Act is silent on aquariums silent on aquatic animals in pet stores. Um, but there is some guidance in the public health service policy. Um, I'm going to skip the stunning part because it's getting late and my time is short and it's not a happy thing. Um, so really quickly, these are some additional threats um, that marine mammals face in particular. Um, and I talked about it a little bit. We can talk about it some more. Um, Marine mammals are at least a species that people are able to see, are able to consider, and sometimes, so they're sort of a keystone species, if you will, for thinking about developing this area. Um, so there are some protections, more for them than for others, and it sets potentially um, a model for us to be thinking about how to protect some of the other animals. Um, really quickly, so the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative is something that we've started at the Animal Law Clinic at Lewis and Clark. This is our mission statement. Um, some of the students who are in the clinic are in the room today. I thank them for their work, and I'm looking forward to more work. Some of the former students are in the room who helped develop and draft this mission statement. And so thanks to them as well for that. So we believe that we need this work. Um, we need this work because these animals are left out of the frameworks which are really important. Um, there's no organization that's dedicated, legal organization, dedicated to focusing on these legal issues. And we think we need to bring them to the attention of people, society, the courts, and the legislatures. Um, so we think doing so is good for the animals, is good for the environment, and is good for people. And we look to harmonize those goals. And so there I will end and say thank you. Um, I want to thank both our speakers, um, and um, I want to now invite people to ask questions. And while you're running up to the microphones, uh, because we can't see if you just raise your hands because of the light up here, I just want to remind everyone that if you did, um, if you are trying to get CLE, 
you have to make sure you so both sign in and sign out, and also remind you that there's a very nifty Mobi app. Um, I think that's, is it Mobley or Mobi? I, you know, I got it on my phone, but I really can't pronounce it. If you use that, it'll bring up um, all the sessions for uh, the uh, conference, and it'll allow you also to um, give an evaluation, and we would appreciate your feedback. So um, some questions, comments, please? And um, so could I, I ask every um, one who comes up to ask questions just to identify themselves in the organizations, too? Yes, good evening. My name is Nzioki, Lewis and Clark, uh, law student. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lin, for your sentient being uh, research. That has helped a lot. Uh, but my question is to my professor, uh, Professor Hessler. I noticed that you mentioned in one of your slides about the Navy using uh, fish for its work. Uh, what, what exactly do they do? I'll just talk loudly. Um, so the Navy does a number of things. Um, they do their own kinds of research, but they do, they also, oh, thank you. Um, they also have uh, used trained dolphins to do a number of things, um, both placing mines and locating mines. And so they will sometimes strap mines onto a dolphin and train the dolphin to swim at great distances and place the mine in some strategic location. Um, so the Navy is doing a number of things. We, we'd love to know more about what the Navy is doing, but some of that, of course, is classified information. So we get some of this information when it, when it becomes more public or, or declassified. But that's one of the things in particular that is pretty problematic. That would actually explain why a few, uh, about a month ago, I was in California. I went for a Navy week, and I saw probably it must have been a dolphin that was swimming by the frigate or something, and they quickly hustled us out of there. They didn't want us to see. They didn't allow us to take any pictures, and it seemed like it was in some distress. I had pulled out my phone to take a picture, but they didn't let us. They chased us away. So. I think now I get it. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Ah. Hi, Brittany Cardoza from um, undergraduate at Ohio State University. Um, I know that you guys are mostly talking about fish and not, we haven't really gotten much to the idea of reptiles, um, but I kind of like, think of them similarly as far as like when it comes to pets because I like I'm at a point in my life where me and my friends are looking at like getting pets and I kind of dawned on me that like any reptile or fish you get is a captive and maybe isn't ethically a great idea and so is there really any like option for owning those kind of animals that where it isn't a captive situation because as far as I can see there isn't Bad luck with microphones. Um, that you can contact uh, local wildlife rehabilitators um, if you're looking, and some of those animals cannot be rehomed, cannot be homed, um, and some can. So that's a place if there's a particular kind of animal you're looking for, they may need your help um, with that. One of the other things I would say is that for every pet, every animal, every individual animal you see in a pet store, there are animals who didn't make it as far as they weren't up to snuff. They didn't look good enough, and so they were just culled. Um, there are animals back there being bred, um, and they're living in lives of confinement. There are animals that died in the transport. So for every single animal you see in a pet store, a number have died depending on the species, a large number or a smaller number. Um, so you're exactly right to think that all of the conversation that we've been having um, both scientifically and legally apply to all of the aquatic species. We just didn't have time to get into the details about all of them, but it's appropriate to bring it up. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, second question. Um, do, is the ag gag laws, which I know we haven't really gotten into much, does that apply to, I've seen some of the videos like that come out of like where reptiles are kept before they get to Petco and like really terrible videos. Is there laws like that address that as well? Um, that kind of shuts down whistleblowers in that like arena? Um, so potentially both AGAG and AIDA, which is the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, 
would have application, they, they don't do it by species, so they just do it by the activity. So if you're doing the undercover videos or the whistleblowing, and if you're on sort of private property, you just have to follow that sort of train of thinking of the laws. So they don't exclude this. Um, so if you're doing, it's not that, <laughs> We, we don't think of including the, the fish when, when it's in their interest, but we're not excluding them when it's in the industry's interest, right? So yeah, the, it's still anything that the activists are doing with regard to those animals is still potentially illegal in those states that have those laws. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pamela Frosch. I'm with the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School. Thank you both for a wonderful presentation. And Kathy, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the fellow program. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> clearly trying to keep time and leaving things out. So um, we are delighted to have started this new aquatic animal law initiative at Lewis and Clark, and we have received funding for a two-year fellow position, um, and we're already underway to get funding to have that be a continuing thing. So anyone interested in that kind of a position, please see me. Hi, Paige Eichelman, Portland, Oregon, biodiversity conservationist and veterinary student. Uh, I have a question of regarding how any kind of welfare or legis legislative controls would be administered for oceanic creatures, given that there's not necessarily a p specific geopolitical uh, force that quote, owns those animals or has jurisdiction. So how would jurisdictionally you handle application of those uh, welfare laws on a global scale? Um, so you raise a really good point, and I think there's a, a, a underlying point to be brought out as well. So one of the difficulties in, in developing welfare standards at all, um, so even if we think about it in the laboratories, is that, so if we've got 4,000 species right, um, in, that are potentially in the labs, that's quite different than the terrestrial animals that we have in the labs. So developing welfare standards in the, that capacity, right, is, is at least easier, and we're not all real happy with how that's gone. So imagine multiplying that by 4,000 species, so it's quite a task. Um, so thinking about what welfare means for these animals is, is a scientific conversation and then an ethical and legal conversation. But getting past that, you're absolutely right. Most of the aquatic species that we're talking about, the fin fish and mollusks and so forth, um, not mollusks, generally speaking, but most of the, the animals that we're talking about live in areas where they're not owned, right? They're beyond territorial boundaries of countries and nation states. And so that means we have to develop cooperative agreements through international protocols. So we have that with the whaling restrictions. Um, so it's not that we don't know how to do that. It's all, we also have a number of models of states, of nations, um, that have voluntarily restricted their own fishing within their own territories as well as outside of in order to recover habitats and fisheries. And so there's conversation about how to do that and which models are best and, and getting by in an agreement from other countries. When you start talking about collapse of species, then you get people to the table to begin to talk about it. But we have the countervailing effort, right, of people saying, no, this is actually better protein for people, um, than, and it's cheaper and it's easier, um, so it will alleviate hunger better. And then also realize that the minute that we start saying, well, let's take care of our oceans and not steal so many animals from those ecosystems, that puts more emphasis on farmed fishing. And so that's not a great response, but that is sort of the answer that some conservationists have to the problems that we deal with in the ocean. So all of that needs to be balanced, but you're right to. to um, and maybe to further reinforce your, your answer, uh, the United States needs to ratify the law of the sea convention first. So you can get to a firm understanding on how to manage its fishing resources. So Jim Karani, wildlife director, former student at uh, Lewis and Clark. Now my question is to both of you. It touches on invasive species. Now, we both know about what zebra mussels have done to, you know, most clogging most of our dams, clogging most of your waterways. You know what um, the sea lampreys have done, you know, taking out the lake trout in um, the Great Lakes region. Now, we need to ask ourselves, most of the methods are being used to control, say, for example, let me use the example of the silver cup, for example, uh, are inhumane and they're not working. So how do we balance the need to manage invasive species while at the same time balancing the welfare of each individual 
uh, creature, probably each individual fish species. It is a, a very difficult moral question. Um, we have problems with lots of invasive species. So, for example, lionfish in the Caribbean are not meant to be there, but have been released by ornamental fish keepers, and they're a voracious predator. So they're considered a, a pest and are, you know, targeted, you know, by fishermen who want to get rid of them because they're destroying the normal balance and biodiversity. And it, I guess it's the same in the sort of terrestrial mammals, you know, the, animals that are seen as pests have like a lower ethical value. So things like rats and mice that damage crops or that are infesting houses have a much lower um, opinion by the public. But yet, um, you know, there are w humane ways of pest control. So there are um, scientists at Liverpool who are looking at scent marking as a way of controlling rodents. And I think it's a, it's a balancing act between what, what, you know, what is the problem and then how do we ensure the health and welfare of the individual. But I'm not really sure from a legal perspective where that falls. It, it is a challenging question. And so obviously prevention is better than trying to solve the problem afterwards. And there are a lot of regulatory channels that we can try to implement to avoid these problems from continuing to happen. I think another thing, though, that we have to do is, is look at our definition of even what is an invasive species. So when I talk with um, my environmental colleagues about this, I often um, challenge them by saying that I think cows are invasive species in the US. Right? The environmental degradation caused by cows, and they're not native to this, this continent at least not in the, their current form. And so we have to think about what is invasive and then try to prioritize our management of those. But I do think it's important to think about even those animals, even though people may consider them pests and say, legally, we don't have an ethical duty to care about them. We should be thinking about them on the species basis and on the individual basis. Um, and I think there are more sort of uh, biolo biologists trying to begin to think about that and trying to do holistic um, problem solving, because one of the other difficulties that um, we encounter is when we try to solve one problem, we often create another. And I'll give you a quick example. The town I used to live in in Ohio had a problem with um, uh, rats. And so then they introduced raccoons, right, to kill the rats. And then there was a problem with raccoons. And so now the wildlife services people are out there killing rats and raccoons. And you know, it just was not a thoughtful response, and that's been too much our response. Let's just kill these animals, and, and, and we don't really care about them or how we kill them, or even put poison out in the environment to kill them, and that's just kind of crazy. So it's, it's a really big problem that we need to think about. There is more being done to regulate what comes across national and, and um, even state borders to try and avoid these problems from becoming significant, and so that's um, a regulatory area we can tighten up quite significantly in the interim. Because I think the greater question is, how long must a species hang around a place before it's called native? Yes. So, yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Um, I'm, my name's Lauren. I'm um, from the University of Texas uh, School of Law. And I'm wondering if studies have shown a range of cognitive abilities amongst fish species. Um, and if so, are, is there a group of species or a particular species that you think could become sort of the, the face of this movement, similar to in you know, terrestrial mammals, we have like the, the great apes and elephants and all these other really cognitively fu like high functioning species? Oh, well, thanks for an interesting question. Um, I mean, there's a range of cognitive abilities in a variety of different fish species. Um, you know, if you look at memory recall, um, it depends on how long lived the species is. So goldfish live up to 45 years and can remember up to three years. Whereas a, a species like stickleback, um, it's a little um, sort of riverine freshwater fish, only lives a year, so its memory stops at 22 days. And fish are very much the, the most su successful vertebrate group on the planet. You know, they evolve and adapt to every single niche that you can think about. Um, so I don't think there's any one particular species that we can hold up as a champion. I think. In terms of the public, it's you know the cor the beautiful coral coral reef fish, which are aesthetically pleasing, and you know we've mentioned the Disney films; those fish have been held up, but that's had negative consequences because when Finding Nemo came out, um, people wanted to have clownfish, but those are incredibly complicated to keep. They like living in an anemone, 
and they uh, require special water. You have to have special um, salts to keep them in and um, very, very detailed husbandry that the person on the street wouldn't have a clue about. Um, and there's, there's been some efforts about Dory, um, which is a regal tang, and lots of um, sort of uh, welfare and conservation charities have come out and said, do not get a regal tang, because it's one of the hardest species to keep. Um, and, you know, the minute you get them in an aquarium, they get diseased because they're so stressed by it, and they're just really complicated. So I think it would be kind of dangerous in a way to hold up one species. But what would be really important is that to see that there's 35,000 different species of fish and all of them are um, sentient and all of them are, are special in their own way. Um, so I think, you know, it's important that, you know, we um, actually protect all of them rather than just singling out any. And I'll just add really quickly as a, as a legal answer, not a scientific answer, um, but building on what Dr. Sneddon said, I don't think we need to wait to find scientific studies for cognition. Right, in order to protect these animals. And so I think it's bizarre that, we real, that we've decided as a human species that animals, any animal, is not um, assumed right, to have cognition or have pain until we prove that they do. And I think we need to flip that and say, of course they should. Why would we think they don't? Right, to be evolutionarily successful, they have to have intelligence. They have to have capacities. They have some capacities we don't have. And so we're not valuing them for being who they are. And we need to start doing that. And so I do think that there's a risk of setting cognition as the, the, the model. And I know that's not exactly what you were suggesting that we do. But I think in thinking about what is it that it, it takes for us to decide to preserve or protect a species, um, we have to have more conversations about what that looks like. And, and as a lawyer, I don't want to wait for all the scientific studies to come in, because that, we were a long way from that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, let me just close by reminding you that we did start out the presentations on some high notes, and I'd like you to think about those. And also, I'd like you to think that, um, understand, I think you do now after this panel, uh, what great opportunities there are in this field to protect literally trillions of creatures. So uh, with that, um, before I let you go to your evenings, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists and thank you. Thank you.